the teacher has completed all else that he needed to say. He has worked out all the central principles until now and the supporting suggestions and implications of his message and elucidated the principal doubts and questions that might rise around it. And now all that rests for him to do is to put into decisive phrase and penetrating formula the one last word, we are coming to the completion of the Gita, last and crowning word is not merely the essence of what has been already said on the matter, not merely a concentrated description of the need itself disciple discipline, the sadhana, and of that greater spiritual consciousness which is to be the result of all its efforts and ascesis, it sweeps out, as it were, yet farther, breaks down every limit and rule, cannot, sorry, canon and formula and opens into a wide and illimitable spiritual truth with an infinite potentiality of significance. This would be the crown of this. Yes, uh, don't be afraid. Drop all the dharmas, follow along, only me. Um, and that is a sign of the profundity, the wide reach, the greatness of spirit of the Gita's teaching. First, the Gita restates the body of its message. So it has to cover everything what was said. It is in this chapter, which we already read. Yeah? It summarizes the whole outline and the essence in the short space of 15 verses. We read them already. Lines of a brief and concept concentrated expression and significance that miss nothing of the kernel of the matter. Couched in, the, in phrases of the most lucid precision and clearness. And they must therefore be scanned with care, must be read deeply in the light of all that has gone before, because here it is evidently in, intended to extract what the Gita itself considers to be the central sense of its own teaching. The statement sets out from the original starting point of the thought in the book, the enigma of human action, the apparently insuperable insu um, difficulty of living in the highest self and spirit while yet we continue to do the works of the world. How to combine both into one? This is the whole puzzle. The easiest way is to give up the problem as insoluble, life and action as an illusion or an inferior movement of existence to be abandoned as soon as we can rise out of the snare of the world into the truth of spiritual being. That was what was offered in the post-Vedic literature, in Mayavada. Drop everything and go into the spirit. That is the ascetic solution. If it can be called a solution. <laughs> Sri Rabindu, it's always something. At any rate, it is a decisive and effective way out of the enigma. The way to which ancient Indian thought of the highest and the most meditative kind, as soon as it commenced to turn at a sharp incline from its first large and free synthesis, had moved always with an increasing preponderance. <laughs> It kind of likes it, likes to move into that, into that easier way out. The Gita, like the Tantra, 
and on certain sides, the later religions, attempts to preserve the ancient balance. This is something very interesting what he says. It's not really giving full solution, as it were. It wants to embrace all possible ways as meaningful, yes? Only to find them the right place. It's what Sri Aurobindo does in his integral yoga. Preserve the ancient balance. It maintains the substance and foundation of the original synthesis, but the form has been changed and renovated in the light of the, a developing spiritual experience. This teaching does not evade the difficult problem of reconciling the full active life of man with the inner life in the highest self and spirit. It advances what is held to be the real solution. It does not at all deny the efficacy of the ascetic renunciation of life for its own purpose, but it sees that that cuts instead of loosening the knot of the riddle, and therefore it accounts it an inferior method and holds its own and the better way. So this is the, how Sri Aurobindo also speaks about integral yoga, instead of cutting the knot, uh, to lose the knot and keep things still in place. The whole discussion which he had with Mayavadins, uh, with one Mayavadin from, um, from Himalayas, one yogi who was 200 years old, was about this. Uh, when he spoke to him, when he told him the ideal of integral yoga, that yogi was so thrilled. He said, this is marvelous, but I cannot go to that ideal yes, to realize the divine in the body because I burned all the bridges. I cut the knot. I cannot go back to life. I can stay only in that kind of beyond space of consciousness, yes, uh, transcendental consciousness. And this body is wearing itself out and slowly dying out. It's of no use anymore. It is not the vehicle of that force anymore. It is just living because it is not dying. I'm not here, I'm there. It's something similar to uh, Ramana Maharshi, something similar. Yeah? He had the same attitude towards the body, body as a disease itself body as, a, as a, an obstacle, you know, which is holding you back and nothing else. So here, instead of cutting the knot, the knot, you have to um, lose the knot, loosening the knot of the riddle and therefore it accounts it an inferior method and holds, holds its own for the better way. This is Gita's way. The two paths both lead us out of the lower ignorant normal nature of man to the pure spiritual consciousness and so for both must be held to be valid and even one in essence but where one stops short and turns back yeah it's kind of i lost the meaning of it but yeah well it's on the same track the two paths both lead us out of the lower ignorant normal nature of man that's quite clear so one can cut the note and be in spiritual consciousness or one can loosen the note and be in spiritual consciousness the same way both have the validity yes lead to spiritual consciousness and so for both must be held to be valid and even one in essence, but where one stops short and turns back. Yeah, there's an error in the OCR. It's instead of so for, it's so far. So far, uh -huh. All right. <laughs> we are kind of jamming Sri Ravinda into the meaningless text. So sorry for this. 
these are so be such beautiful texts and we have such a corrupted text and struggling with meaning meaning itself is difficult even if you read it properly <laughs> and if there are also misprints uh, okay thank you for this for two paths both lead us out of the lower ignorant normal nature of man to the pure spiritual consciousness and so far both must be held to be valid yeah and they are both valid and even one in essence truly speaking but where one stops short the other most probably turns back other turns back yeah? not end i have no idea it's other yeah you see yeah, i'm just following along from the from the text itself uh, interesting yeah thank you so the other advances the other oh yeah we continue the other advances with firm subtlety and high courage opens a gate on unexplored vistas completes man in god and unites and reconciles in the spirit soul and nature so if one part which cuts the knot is turning away from nature and uh, stops in the transformation of nature by the divine the other advances with a firm subtlety and high courage comes back opens a gate on unexplored vistas which we have no idea about yet because the divine yet had to engage itself with nature yes and these will be totally new uh, events in the spiritual uh, evolution so completes man in god and unites and reconciles in the spirits soul and nature and therefore in the first five of these verses the gita so phrases its statement that it shall be applicable to both to both the way of the inner and the way of the outer renunciation and yet in such a manner that one has only to assign to some of their common expressions a deeper and more inward meaning in order to get sense and thought of the method favored by the Gita. So Gita is kind of camouflaging it. Uh, she's not opening us totally, it doesn't make them black and white. It keeps them both. Yeah? So if you want to cut the note, you cut it. Yeah? If you want to go farther, you also will see it there something like like the Veda is doing with its own you know all right Whew, sorry for this long passage <laughs> Therese and Charles are falling into the trance most probably with all this reading <laughs> yeah. survived I will give you uh, the chance to read all this Doug can read better. Somebody with English, proper English. Uh, so here we are, this 49. We read 49. We read the passage of 49. So we come to this. Asakta buddhih sarvatra jitatma vigatas prehach nashkarmya siddhim paramam sanyasena dhigachati. So by sanyasa, by the renunciation one comes to the supreme realization or perfection of naishkarmya naishkarmya is a specific term which means the state in which nothing can be done or nothing should be achieved anymore or effortless state of being where everything is unfolding naturally would you say it's a state where there is no action that must be done right right nothing to be done and nothing to be not done right 
So in other words, uh, the normal imperative to action that applies to people who still have karma uh, no longer applies. Right. There is no more motivation by, by that, you know, cause and effect thing. Yeah. Nature no longer imposes any obligation to act or not act. Right. And this is an amazing state. Sometimes we have the experience of such a state. The most, the best way when we act is when it is effortless, that we even don't remember that what we did. It was like living, like breathing. It was not something which we made, you know, we had to sweat and with blood and sweat and labor and uh, with plan and follow, check, 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 and what else is to be done. It's all very mechanical, very mental, very deadly for us. Yeah? It destroys our spirit. But if it is like, a, like living, as Shubindu says, when one is on the top of Himalayas, yes, rules all the energies on earth and participating in all the events and changes the events on earth and feels that one is doing nothing. This is the state. <laughs> so Vladimir, would you, can you relate that then to the subjective age that Sri Aurobindo speaks of? Most probably, yes, I didn't think of subjective age here. Yes, because subjective age implies actually opening of our inner being. Inner being becomes part of our activities, where we are naturally following our svadharma, our inner being. If we would, all of us would follow our svabhava, inner nature, we would feel very differently. Yeah? We would be really enjoying the manifestation. And once in a while, we feel that joy. Right. So by sannyasa, it can be gained. Sannyasa is uh, here, in general, that which covers tyaga in sannyasa. Yeah? without distinction. That's why Shubindu points to that, that Gita does not really try to make black and white distinction. And then, Siddhim praptah yatha brahma tathap noti nibodhame samase naiva kaunteya nishtha jnanasya yapara. I will read Shirobindu's translation first. How, having attained this perfection, one thus attains to Brahman, hear from me, O son of Kunti, that which is the supreme concentrated direction of the knowledge. This is Nishtha Jnanasya. Yes, Nishtha is actually the foundation of knowledge the foundation of self-realization, the very quintessential truth of self-realization, the supreme. Samasena, in briefly, o kaunteya ni bodhame, hear, or become aware, I will declare that to you, that siddhi. And here there is a footnote for this, which we have to read. A footnote for uh, knowledge. That nishtha jnanasya. The knowledge meant here is the yoga of sankhyas. Of sankhya. The yoga of pure knowledge accepted by the Gita, Jnana Yogana Sankhyanam. So far as it is one with its own yoga, which includes also the way of works of the yogins, Karma Yogana Yoginam. So these two phrases are used from the beginning, the distinction between Jnana Yoga and Karma Yoga. Jnana Yoga is for people who follow the, uh, the path of philosophy, who are philosophizing, 
who are looking for the patterns as Charles and Teresa they are trying to find <laughs> singularity. They have to co kind of comprehend how the world is uh, built and what it means, where we are in all this, how consciousness reveals itself in consciousness. But uh, Karma Yogana is for yogins. Um, the yoga uh, of Karma Yoga is for those who do the action. That means who are seeking an experience. So experiential people on one side and those who are seeking realization by knowledge is on the other side. And both are needed for the Gita. But all mention of works is kept back for the moment. For by Brahman, he is meant at first the silent, the impersonal, the immutable. The Brahman indeed is both for the Upanishads and the Gita, all that is and lives and moves. That's the presentation by Charles and Teresa about Brahman. It is not solely an impersonal infinite or an unthinkable and incommunicable absolute, a chintyam of Yavaharyam. All this is Brahman, says the Upanishad. All this is Vasudeva, says the Gita. The Supreme Brahman is all that moves or is stable and his hand and feet and eyes and heads and faces are on every side of us. It is not that by the word that we speak about Brahman, says Kenayas, it is by Brahman that we speak the word. So, Yadvachana Bhuditam, which, which cannot be spoken by the word, but by which the word is spoken, that is Brahman, <laughs> which cannot be seen by the eye, by but by which the eye is seeing, that is Brahman, which cannot be thought by the mind, but by which the mind is thinking, that is Brahman, which cannot be heard by the hearing, but by which the hearing hears, that is Brahman. So consciousness is pervasive, it's present through all the faculties. That's why this description, thousands of legs and heads and eyes all over, why thousand? Because thousand is in infinity, pervasive, present everywhere. Yeah. But still there are two aspects of this all. His immutable eternal self that supports existence and his self of active power that moves abroad in the world movement. This is from Isha Upanishad. It is only when we lose our limited ego personality in the impersonality of the self that we arrive at the calm and free oneness by which we can possess a true unity with the universal power of the divine in his world movement. So there is a first step, liberation. Yeah? So the impersonal, silent Brahman is to be realized first, before the dynamic Brahman can be realized. Shubhendu had this realization exactly in this order. First was the silent Brahman descended upon him, the Nirvanic experience with Vishnu Bhaskar Lale, and then in Alipur jail, he had that dynamic Brahman, no? the spiritual experience spiritual transformation, so-called. Um, impersonality is a denial of limitation and division. That's why we need it. And the cult of impersonality is a natural condition of true being. An indispensable preliminary of true knowledge and therefore a first requisite of true action. 
we can't be true in action before because we do not know ourselves yet so we have to realize our unborn self before we will be um, ready for the true action <laughs> with no mistakes yeah? it is very clear i'm here it is very clear that we cannot become one self with all or one with the universal spirit and his vast self-knowledge his complex will and his widespread world purpose by insisting on our limited personality of ego i want <laughs> doesn't work that way <laughs> can't arrive through this assertion by ego for that divides us from others and it makes us bound and self-centered in our view and in our will to action this is karmic consequences are coming imprisoned in personality we can only get a limited union by sympathy or by some relative accommodation of ourselves to the viewpoint and feeling and will of others that's why we seek some good company friends and you know enemies we divide them those who are sympathetic to us with them we can feel at home and safe but can you imagine you're safe with the whole world there are no more enemies <laughs> nowhere <laughs> in whatever form imprisoned yes that's i read um to be one with all and with the divine and his will in the cosmos we must become at first impersonal and free from our ego and its claims and from the ego's way of seeing ourselves and the world and others and we cannot do this if there is not something in our being other than the personality other than the ego the impersonal self one with all existences we must realize that impersonal self which is already one with all existences and that becomes the ground of oneness to lose ego and to be this impersonal self to become this impersonal Brahman in our consciousness is therefore the first movement of this yoga. Well, I think I stop here. Yeah? Yes. That was the first moment of this yoga. <laughs> Well, for many, it is the last moment. They want to be, um, to be that only and to leave the, the nature behind. And they cut the knot and they rush into that Brahman and dissolve themselves there. Mm -hmm. And they think this is done. There's nothing else to do. And it is true. But more is possible. Yeah? So here there are three verses. Let us read them. Buddhya, oh my god, time is flying. Buddhya Shuddhaya Yukto, Buddhya Shuddhaya Yukto, Dhritiatmanam Niyam Yacha, Shabdadin Vishayan Stiaktva, Ragadveshav Vyudas Yacha, Vivikta Sevi Lagvashi, Yatavak kaya manasah, dhyana yoga paro, nityam vairagyam samupashritah, ahankaram balam darpam kamam krodham parigraham, bimuchya nirmamah shantah brahma bhuyaya kalpate. These are three verses put here into Sri Aurobindo's translation. I will go through his translation uniting the purified intelligence 
with the pure spiritual substance in us, controlling the whole being by firm and steady will, having renounced sound and other objects of the senses, withdrawing from all liking and disliking, resorting to impersonal solitude, abstemism, speech, what is abstemious? Uh, speech, body and mind controlled, constantly united with the inmost self by meditation, completely giving up desire and attachment, having put away egoism, violence, arrogance, desire, wrath, the sense and instinct of possession free from all I-ness and minus, calm and luminously impassive, one is fit to become the Brahman. Now we know what is to be fit to become Brahman. Much to do. <laughs> yeah. so, that, that mysterious word, excuse me, the, uh, abstemious. Abstemious. Earth, yeah, it means not self-indulgent, especially when eating and drinking. Yes, yes. I was kind of checking this word before, abstemious, yes. It fits for me, actually. <laughs> Here, my problem is excessive eating, and this is, um, I have to control, yeah. Because there is not, nothing else to, to indulge in, <laughs> in the nature. Only eating is left. <laughs> so you go to the fridge and you start indulging. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask a question? Yes. Um, this has been really, really very difficult for me to understand for a very, for decades now. If one is to transform the body and to transform the ego into a uh, higher being, um, higher mind, higher being, supramental being, how does one maintain the sense of one's own self with others if the whole ego is gone? How does that happen? One sees oneself in all other selves and all the other selves in oneself. There is no more difference in that sense. There is only the varieties of relations, the delight of, of all possible um, varieties of touches, thoughts, feelings, exchange of emotions. It's like, it's like you are kissed from all sides. <laughs> And you're oh kissing goodness. all yeah. the sides. Yeah. I, I thought that was a more advanced state, where in the, the first state of Brahma Nirvana, you're separate. You feel separate from activity. And so at that point, if you, it's, it may sound sensible to just deny the relative in action, in the need for action. But it's a more advanced. The next state would be the, the, the self and the, the world, but not together as one. And then the third state is that um, unitedness, I think with super, um, the, the super mental, where the, the self and the world, the, the, the shara and the akshara are both there as one and not as separate, no gulf between them. Yes, because the, uh... When I keep my kshara purusha and I realize my akshara purusha's consciousness, then yes. And this akshara is uniting all the selves, yeah? And I, I am I'm no more separate from them in the sense of kind of, they are not a threat for me, I'm not a threat for them, yeah? Uh, they, are, they are the varieties of delight of one being, which I perceive. I enjoy because I don't claim them to be my food. They don't claim me to be their food. That's why I use this word kissing, because kissing is an interesting thing. I was thinking all my life about this. What is kissing? Yeah? Kiss. Mother says if there would be no kiss, universe would be poor. 
And I was thinking, what is this <laughs> kiss? <laughs> Poor universe without kiss. Um, because I never could understand kiss. Yeah? One thing is pleasure, but pleasure is something else. But the symbol, the oh. highest symbol, the soul. Uh, and then I understood by, by when I saw this beautiful <clears throat> picture where the lady is kissing the elephant, I just, an elephant leans up to, to her for the kiss, <laughs> big elephant to the small lady <laughs> to be kissed. And I understood the kissing is kind of uniting without consuming, without destroying, without gobbling, without appropriating. But uniting, it's it's the sign of union where we appropriate, where we are open to the innermost ourselves. We connect that with the other being, and the touch of the lips is that symbol of union, love. This is love. That means I am one with you without consuming you, without making you part of my own enjoyment my own, regardless to what you feel. No? It's like one's, one's actions or works flows just simply into another's action or works. And it's just, the, and there's this harmony of flow there that what one does, the other one uh, moves through. And then what that, the other one does, the another one moves even farther um, into the movement. Um, it's, wow, it's, this is astounding. I'm really, yeah, I understand a, a little more. I understand more. Thank you. Yeah, Shobindra describes the state of the realization highest, where the cosmic consciousness is realized that everything becomes a touch of Brahman and delight, but everything. There's nothing here in the world which will cause something else, you know. So the look is the touch of the delight of Brahman, the touch, the everything, the kiss, uh, the movement, the, the exchange of thoughts, the self-expression, uh, the interaction, communication, everything is as delight flowing through. Uh, there is no more shrinking. There is no more need to protect oneself. There is nobody to protect oneself from. Yeah. Everywhere is the delight and bliss. This is the state in which we can multiply the delight. I can bring more the delight to you. You bring more the delight to me by our interaction. It's actually all about the delight, yeah? to multiply the delight. The whole purpose of this manifestation is the delight, yeah? to make it more. As Mother says, the, the reason of the creation was the additional Ananda, to create more Ananda <laughs> and nothing else. What's the point of manifesting the divine if not an additional Ananda, more um, joy? Somebody's calling me, so sorry. Um, yeah. But here, the whole description, somebody was complaining that the mother in, uh, I think in 1970, announced that we have to be free from personal possessions to be in Auroville. I remember old Aurovillian, she was not, she first invited us and then she said we have to be free from personal <laughs> possessions. <laughs> was very offended lady. <laughs> it was not good. She should warn us before, <laughs> otherwise we would not come. Yeah? So here the whole list, what is to be free from, and why to be free from that? Because it is that limitation, egoistic limitation, which is not allowing us to discover the divine. And the divine is everywhere looking at us from all sides and we can't see it, can't interact with it because we are so afraid, so small in our interaction with the world, so limited. 
And it's not easy to break that limitation. We need the realization of impersonal Brahman first. Otherwise, it will be a fake thing. We will, we will uh, you know, pretend to be free, which is the case in many, in many such communities, spiritual communities, where people and teachers pretend to be free because they know what they have to do to, to, to seem to be free yeah? and then to grab somebody and <laughs> gobble <laughs> and appropriate. That's what, what is happening. Yeah? catching the flies and enjoying for oneself. But to be really free, one needs to be to have this nirvanic experience first and not to dissolve oneself there, but to allow that more intense coming back with more courage, with more adventure to discover the divine plan for this manifestation with that freedom. And this is the ideal of integral yoga and the Gita. Maybe I can say yeah, yeah. Uh, I Vladimir, excuse me. Yes. Okay, I want to share something, but it's I think is I try ahead, to make sense. Um, it seems to me um, like we, we are trying to go from the smallest to the biggest, but I think it's more, it's more clear if we accept we are the highest in a lower manifestation. Mm -hmm. But it's not possible coming from the lowest to the highest. Only, only it's possible to be in silence, to accept we are the highest. I think when they say the silence is to stop the mind, to stop the thought, to stop the ego. And then we are from the highest, watching, observing, enjoying the manifestation in this lower realm. But trying to come to go from the lowest to the highest, I think it's a dream. It's only... Well, a there dream. is a method to come from the lowest to the highest by, by that silencing the mind, as you said. This, uh, these are the methods, yeah? Uh, controlling the senses, um, yama ni yama. There are many ways of doing it. <laughs> bit by bit, step by step, you you calm the system down, and that what is there beyond is shining through. And once it is there through, you get a new experience, new awareness, awareness which cannot be now altered by by the nature. You see, you find your unborn self. You are mukta. There yes, is but think, to arrive at it, yes. But but this is something like my my intuition tell me is some like a mistake to try to build something more complicated to achieve the highest when the most uh, directly way is to take in a way all these uh, constructed thought or building with thoughts or thinking uh, with this kind of uh, uh, monologue we are trying to make in, in ourselves. But when you stop to make this monologue inside of your head, you are the construction and then it's simple. It's more simple, it's more direct because it's already there. I, I agree with um, I totally agree with that in, in my in my thinking and uh, the, it, it seems to me like the coming from the lowest to the highest is, is so well spoken that it's my ego that wants to come from the lowest to the highest <laughs> when the 
when the absolute truth already is that we are already that, that we aspire to. And it seems like it's my my memories that are inherent in my in my body and my DNA that I've identified myself with that makes me think that I am the lowest. When that uh, when when I read the the the, the writings of Sri Aurobindo or, or any other um, books of wisdom, it it seems like it's always about from the highest to the lowest. When when I what happens when I read Sri Aurobindo, it's in order he writes from that place to that place within me, and to even understand, I have to raise my thinking. And it's in that raising of the thinking that something happens when it seems like, it, to me, it seems like it's all about thinking. That my, my thinking is what is what prevents me from realizing what already is. And so I, I, I tend to think like you, Sifu, in that regards. Um, it was kind of uh, additional thought, or I think the same way, actually, <laughs> that is, not, no, it was a kind of objection or addition, addition most probably, or you, you are sharing your, yes, but this is only first step, first step to, to find that, uh, that that thing which we are already are, we are already that, yeah, has to shine through. But the problem with uh, religions such as, for example, you know, Hinduism, Mayavada, or uh, the Vedanta, or whatever, or Buddhism, is that this becomes the full end, full stop. So once that Brahman is shining through, and this is the highest realization, then why do you need anything else, you know? Why do you have to suffer here to do something? And there is something more, it seems. There's something more is waiting. And Sri Aurobindo so beautifully describes this in this in Savitri, in the book of uh, this uh, Godheads of the Little Life we read the other day. It is amazing. So there are, and I understood what Buddhism is doing. Buddhism is as, as Mayavada, the same. They are drawing you to something which is already there. There's nothing to achieve. You just stop kind of blocking it away and it will shine through. Don't, don't block it. Yeah? Pacify your mind, pacify your feelings, purify your body, and then it will come through because it is there always. So once it is there, this is the end of the story. So you don't have to achieve anything. You don't have to go anywhere. There's no aim of life. You just live. You don't need to express any higher truth in any poetry, in any kind of art, in any creation. It's not really needed. You just be that all. And that all is enough to be. This is Buddhism. You become like a vegetable, very nice vegetable, very tasty, very good looking, very peaceful, very hum harmless, uh, very joyful for others to see, uh, very uh, giggling all the time happily uh, because there is nothing, nothing to do, you know, it's all already done. What else is there to do? But when you bring the aim, the purpose, the intensity, the evolution, somewhere to go, which was never realized. Not this which is settled in everything, but which was never realized. This is Sri Aurobindo, and this is the Gita. There is something else to be achieved. We have to work for the divine. We are not here just to get into that joyful vegetable state we we are here the the 
the vehicles of the divine realization of his need to be many we have to become supreme not only in the passive state of spirit of silent state but also in the dynamism of interaction do we have that do we have that creativity which which manifests the divine in all possible forms and beauty and bliss we don't have it yet so but that first stage is the must yeah that brahman has to be realized for the next stage to be effective and this is Sri Aurobindo's two steps in yoga. That's what he says to Pavitra when he comes to him. Yes, mukti is very good. Mukti, this is mukti. Yeah? But mukti you can receive from many teachers in India. Only you have to learn their language, he says to him. My first stage of mukti is gone. I am in the second stage to bring shakti into the adhar, into all the fibers of my bee and start transforming this life here you know, and making it divine and he says this ideal is much more difficult and i would never suggest it to anyone only for those who are chosen called upon but i see that something in you is calling to that ideal he says to pavitra and something answers to your call so you may stay with me and see how far you can go. Sri Aurobindo says so beautifully there at the end, how far you can go without me, Father, <laughs> when you receive from me all the support so in such a humble way. There's more to but, achieve. But then it's not the lowest going to the highest is the highest going to far away uh, no not far away uh, super highest uh, lowest highest doesn't really mean for me much because the lowest is the divine and the highest is the divine and uh, the lowest is only the particular state in which certain capacities are present or absent and the highest is another set of capacities present or absent this is how I see it. I'm really not judging it, you know. The divine is okay. more pragmatical. The lowest is the is the experience of of our our life entity who needs thought to to thinking needs to thinking to 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 experience in itself. I have to think to exist, like <laughs> like the car. No, I'm thinking, then I exist. I think is this is the lowest expression, because you can you can be you can exist without thought, without thinking about you. You are existing already. Then this could be higher than the other one if we compare relatively, but. Then you are now you are appointing to another another possibility is this existence this true existence could be better could be Absolutely. another thing for me. you can have golden thoughts not just <laughs> dull thoughts like uh, lightnings think... thought lightnings you know. But I think the, this kind of su super uh, existence is is beyond the thought. Is I think thought is very very. How do we know? We, we we didn't go there yet. But I believe that it is. It will all. Everything will be included, and all these what we see as symbols. We are speaking about symbols in our symbolic studies. Why they are symbols? Because they are not yet realized divinities. When they will get their divine nature, they will stop being symbols. They will become I, I, divine manifestations. But I think if we need symbols, I think uh, we are not so 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 far away, because when we are using thoughts as symbols, 
the, we need an observer or a, a listener of the thought. If you need to th to thinking about it, it's because you are observing your own thought. Then you are you are in the same in the same uh, what is a booklet right. loop. Right. Or you can be also generator of thoughts. Can you imagine that you generate the lightnings and these lightnings are producing beings? Wow. <laughs> you see, Wonderful. there is more scope to think of, <laughs> not only within this realm which we have. Mother says that in the future, the, the beings will be born from power of thought not from the interaction of the uh, sexes, not through sex uh, organs, but through the thought process. Thought itself becomes the, uh, the conception of the being. I, I mean, Are we, these we don't mental know. For, the hmm. Mental formations? Are, are, are these med mental formations what you are talking about? Or is another? Yes, dimension? it's a mental thought, yes mental thought which becomes the thought of the you know the mind of light which about which Bindu spoke at the end of his life he spoke that mentality our ordinary mentality can be illumined and transformed by the supramental light and it will change its nature and functions will be very different and this is the transformation which we cannot even envision, because we didn't go that way. We want only peace. Mm -hmm. We want happiness without reason. The Brahman everywhere. But that is only first step. There's more to be done. He, he wants to go farther than we <laughs> can see now. Yes? But uh, only such beings uh, as Sri Aurobindo, Sri Krishna could show us the way. So even here he says that uh, Gita does not really deny that, does not make black and white, he even embraces whatever is there because it is very useful. Realization of Brahman is absolutely necessary. So why to deny it? Why to say something farther away if this was not realized? But still it puts here and there more saying something more which is kind of contradicting to that brahman state kind of it doesn't contradict it contradicts only in the mind in the lower mind which thinks black and white all right uh, we can stop here thank you for these questions and these provocative thoughts that's very nice we will Continue from 40, from this 54. I will close with mantra. Om Sarve Bhavanto Sukhinaha Sarve Santo Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makashchit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. But look, even to fit for the Brahman consciousness here, you, what you have to become is impossible. You have to be inmost, uh, with the inmost self by meditation, completely giving up desire and attachment, having put away egoism, violence, arrogance, desire, wrath, the sense and instinct of possession, free from all I-ness and minus, <laughs> calm and luminously impassive. And then maybe <laughs> you will fit for this Brahmanic consciousness, which is first step in yoga. So what what are we talking about, Father? When we... There's much to do. So. Great. Okay, let's um, continue next time. Stay. Namaste. Stay. Namaste.